Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us and welcome to this virtual meeting of the National Transportation Safety Board. I'm Jennifer Hamandy and I'm honored to serve as the chair of the NTSB. Joining us today are my colleagues on the board, Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, Member Michael Graham, and Member Tom Chapman. Today we meet in open session as required by the government in the Sunshine Act to consider the runway overrun during landing of a Saab 2000 in Unalaska, Alaska that occurred on October 17, 2019. The airplane was substantially damaged when it overran the end of the runway, passed through the airport perimeter fence, crossed a road and pitched down over shoreline rocks with its nose wheel coming to rest at the edge of Dutch Harbor. Tragically, one passenger was killed, another sustained serious injuries, and eight other passengers sustained min minor injuries. On behalf of all of us at the NTSB, I'd like to offer my deepest sympathies to those who were impacted by this tragedy. Today may be a difficult day for you, and I'm truly sorry for all that you're going through. Our hearts go out to each and every one of you. Please know that all of those involved with this investigation have worked to ensure that everything that could be learned from this event was uncovered. Our goal today is to ensure that the lessons learned in this accident and the actions that can be taken to prevent such an accident from happening again are captured in our report and safety recommendations. To that end, each board member has studied the draft report and met individually with the investigative team. But today's board meeting is the first time that we've gathered as a board to discuss the report. Viewers will notice some changes to this board meeting. The board has formed a working group to evaluate board meeting effectiveness to ensure that our safety messages are clearly understood. Staff will still present the pertinent facts and analysis and summarize what they found. After the presentations, we on the board will discuss the key safety issues brought to light by this accident, issue by issue, and then staff will propose the findings, probable cause, and safety recommendations for board consideration. The public docket for this investigation contains nearly 4,000 pages of additional relevant material and is available on our website at ntsb.gov. The final report will also be available on our website in just a few weeks, once any amendments voted upon today are incorporated and the report is finalized for release. At this time, I'd like to invite each of my colleagues on the board to introduce themselves. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, colleagues and staff members. Uh, look forward to participating. Good to see you. Member Graham. Good afternoon, Chair Hominy, Vice Chairman Landsberg, and Member Chapman, and the investigative staff. I look forward to our deliberations today. Good seeing you, Mike. Member Chapman. Good afternoon, Chair Hominy and colleagues. To our staff, uh, thank you very much for your outstanding work on this investigation. Look forward to the discussions. Good seeing you, Tom. Thank you very much. I'll now ask Deputy Managing Director for Investigations, Brian Curtis, to introduce the staff who will be participating in today's meeting. Good afternoon, Mr. Curtis. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chair Armandy. I'd also like to thank everyone who helped make this virtual board meeting happen today. My only administrative announcement today is a reminder for the meeting participants to silence all their electronic devices at this time. Now I'll introduce the staff for today's meeting. Captain David Helson, Deputy Director of the Office of Aviation Safety. Dr. Sathya Silva, Investigator in Charge. Steve McGladry, Systems. Dr. Dewan Civilian, System Safety and Human Performance. Captain Marvin France, Operations. Kathleen Silba, General Counsel for the NTSB. Dolly and Hatchett, Director of the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Jim Ritter, Director for the Office of Research and Engineering. Charles Cates, Flight Data Recorder and Visuals. Kevin Renzi, 
aircraft performance, Jason Fedock, survival factors, Karen Stein, report writer, and Nathan Hoyt, safety recommendations. The presentations will begin with an investigation overview by the investigator in charge, Dr. Sathya Silva. Ms. Silva. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Hammondy, Vice Chairman Landsberg, and members of the board. On October 17, 2019, about 5.40 p.m. Alaska Daylight Time, Pen Air Flight 3296, the Saab 2000, overran the runway during landing at Unalaska, Alaska, also referred to as Dutch Harbor. The aircraft was substantially damaged, and of the 42 crew and passengers on board, one passenger was fatally injured, one passenger seriously injured, and eight passengers sustained minor injuries. The airplane departed Anchorage at 3.23 p.m. for a planned two hour and 10 minute flight. The Dutch runway configuration was 1331. The winds at Dutch as the flight progressed were shifting but generally favored runway 31. As they neared Dutch Harbor, the crew elected to approach the airport via the route that set them up to intercept final for a straight in to runway 13. During their first approach, the crew conducted a go around for an unstabilized approach. They then turned left to follow the traffic pattern. After the go around, the captain suggested they switch to land runway 31, while the first officer suggested continuing to runway 13. They ultimately decided to continue the pattern to 13. The crew then requested a wind check from the weather observer who responded that midfield winds were from 300 at 24. In response to this tailwind information, the first officer asked the captain, do you want to back out, do it again? To which the captain ultimately responded, last try. And they continued their, they continued their approach to runway 13. The airplane main gear touched down about 1,100 feet past the displaced threshold, followed shortly thereafter by the nose gear. About 1,800 feet down the runway, the left main landing gear outboard tire began skidding. 300 feet after this point, onboard video taken by a passenger showed a puff of smoke that indicated a tire burst. About 100 feet, 150 feet prior to the end of the pavement, the aircraft veered to the right. The red circle indicates the area the aircraft left the paved surface and is the focus of the video on the next slide. Security camera video captured the airplane as it crossed over the road and came to rest on shoreline rocks. For reference, the camera is looking north-northeast and you can see the curved roadway adjacent to the end of runway 13 at the left of the frame. I will pause before starting the video to allow those that do not wish to view to look away. The video will play in real time speed and I will now play the video. A performance study based on the airplane flight manual, non-normal configuration, and flight test data were conducted, was conducted to evaluate stopping capability of the aircraft on the runway. The study determined that the accident airplane touched down at 142 knots ground speed with a 15 knot tailwind. Despite the tailwind with normal wheel braking for flaps 20 or 35, the airplane should have safely stopped on the runway. Further, even if it had experienced a 50% loss in wheel braking, the airplane should have been able to stop on the runway or within the existing runway safety area. However, the, de the deceleration during the accident rollout was worse than expected and the airplane required more distance to stop. 
This evidence combined with skid marks and a burst main, main gear tire indicated a problem with the aircraft wheel brake system. Mr. McGladry will discuss the brake system investigation and findings during his presentation. The safety issues identified in this accident were the cross wiring of the anti-skid brake system during maintenance, a lack of consideration for human error during maintenance and manufacturer system safety assessments, the need for safety management systems for organizations that design, manufacture, and maintain aircraft, FAA oversight of carriers undergoing periods of significant organizational change, and FAA approval of the Saab 2000 operation at Dutch Harbor without consideration of the available runway safety area. Each of these topics will be addressed in staff's presentations. I'd like to acknowledge the following NTSB staff who supported this investigation. Parties to the investigation were the FAA, Pan Air, and Crane Aerospace and Electronics. In accordance with ICAO Annex 13, an accredited representative was appointed by the Swedish Accident Investigation Authority as the state of manufacture, with Saab and EASA named as technical advisors. Also, the United Kingdom Air Accidents Investigation Branch appointed an accredited representative with APPH Limited, Rolls-Royce, and Dowdy Propell Propellers named as technical advisors. That concludes my presentation. Mr. Gladry will now continue. Good afternoon. I will discuss how the brake system anomaly substantially affected the accident airplane's braking performance. I will describe the operation of the Saab 2000 anti-skid system, provide the important findings related to the accident airplane brake system, show the difficulties with routing the anti-skid system wiring, and of troubleshooting incorrect routing if it occurs. I will describe when the incorrect routing occurred on the accident airplane and what actions have been taken since the accident. The Saab 2000 anti-skid system consists of an anti-skid control unit, wheel speed transducers, and hydraulic control valves. The control unit has an inboard channel and an outboard channel. The control unit receives wheel speed from a transducer in the axle of each of the four wheels. The control unit sends commands to the inboard and outboard hydraulic control valves to reduce the hydraulic brake pressure commanded from the pilot's brake pedals, which are not shown here. The system manages skids and pairs. The paired wheels are the left and right inboard wheels and the left and right outboard wheels. When an excessive skid is sensed by the wheel speed transducers, brake pressure is to re reduce to both wheels in the pair to eliminate the skid. Examination of the anti-skid wheel speed transducer wire harnesses on the left main landing gear of the accident airplane revealed that they were incorrectly routed, which resulted in the wiring for the sensors to be crossed. The left main landing gear outboard tire was flat from a skid. However, fault messages showed that the anti-skid system was commanding a full release of brake pressure to the inboard pair of wheels for most of the landing rollout. The incorrectly routed wire harnesses on the left main landing gear significantly affected braking performance in the skid condition. The left outboard tire skidding was not relieved and it quickly burst. The left and right inboard tire pair were commanded to near zero brake pressure. The result was loss of braking capability on three of the four wheels after the tire burst. Only the right outboard tire was providing normal braking during the landing. On the accident airplane, the incorrect routing caused the left main gear inboard wheel speed to be connected to the outboard channel of the anti-skid control unit and the outboard wheel speed to be connected to the inboard channel. With the accident airplane's cross wiring, 
the skid of the left outboard tire is now sensed by the inboard channel of the anti-skid control unit, and it commands a reduction in brake pressure to both inboard wheels. Because the skid continues, the inboard channel continues to reduce brake pressure to the two inboard tires until it is near zero. The outboard brake pressures are unchanged, and so the skid is not relieved, and the tire will quickly skid through it and burst. This combination results in th the loss of three of the four tires braking capability. This photo shows the landing gear with arrows showing the wheel speed transducer wire harnesses. The two harnesses are routed down the aft side of the main landing gear shock strut through a hole in the center of the axle and one is routed out to connect to the transducer here and one to the transducer on the other wheel. Above the level of the photo, the routing is difficult to access because it is a very confined area in the wheel well. It is hard to see and difficult to reach when connecting to the electrical connectors. The photo will now fade to show a detailed schematic of the routing. This schematic shows the correct routing of the wheel speed transducer harnesses on the landing gear. Item 10 in blue shows the correct routing to the right wheel, and item 20 in yellow shows the left wheel routing. The incorrect routing occurred at the top of the strut with the wire harnesses numbered 10 and 20 in the opposite positions. There are labels on each wire harness. These labels are located at the top of the wire harnesses near the connectors where it is difficult to access. However, there are no labels at the bottom portion of the harness to indicate correct connection. So if the wire harnesses were incorrectly routed at any point, it would be difficult to determine when connecting the wheel speed transducers. Before the accident, there were no maintenance manual procedures to determine if the harnesses were incorrectly installed. The anti-skid system is not capable of detecting cross-wiring condition. A fault message might occur and be recorded if an excessive skid occurs, but the fault would not be clearly related to the cross-wiring condition. There is no troubleshooting procedures for the fault message, so mechanics will have great difficulty identifying a cross-wiring condition. We reviewed the Penair maintenance records and there was no maintenance performed by Penair, which would require removal of the harnesses. The landing gear was overhauled by the manufacturer, APPH, in January 2017, which is when the incorrect routing most likely occurred. Since the accident, manufacturers and regulators have taken action to mitigate the incorrect wire harnesses. Saab initiated a fleet inspection using new test procedures in April 2020, which was followed by EASA and FAA issuing airworthiness directives mandating the inspections and the landing gear manufacturer, APPH, introduced enhanced overhaul procedures. We found that inadequate labeling and difficult access could still lead to incorrect harness routing during maintenance. If incorrect routing occurs, there's no troubleshooting procedure to resolve the fault message recorded by the anti-skid system. Therefore, staff recommends Saab redesign the wheel speed transducer wire harnesses for the Saab 2000 airplane to prevent the harnesses from being incorrectly installed during maintenance and overhaul. Thank you. Dr. Civilian will now continue. Good afternoon. I will discuss the following system safety and human performance issues in this accident. Saab's hazard assessment related to cross wiring of wheel speed transducers, FAA and EASA's position on SMS for organizations that design, manufacture, and maintain aircraft, pilot decision making and leadership, and SMS for air carriers. Identifying human error in maintenance can reduce the possibilities of hazards to the airplane and its occupants. One way to reduce the possibility of a hazard is to perform a system safety assessment. System safety assessments comprise several analyses, including functional hazard assessments. 
The intent of a functional hazard assessment is to determine potential system failures that could lead to hazards that could affect the airplane and its occupants. SOB system safety assessment analyzed several hazard conditions for the landing gear and anti-skid system that may have the potential to occur in maintenance and system malfunctions or failures that could affect flight crew performance. However, there was no evidence that SOB assessed human error in maintenance that could lead to cross wiring of wheel speed transducers and the effect it could have on the airplane and flight crew. As a result, SOB did not analyze any anti skid wiring failure modes. The lack of an analysis of these failure modes, including an assessment of probability and severity, underestimated the extent the effect of such hazard had on the airplane and flight crew. In addition, SOB system safety assessment did not evaluate flight deck enunciations, procedures, and training that could mitigate such a hazard before takeoff and landing. The MTSB has investigated events involving cross-wiring of anti-skid components in maintenance, which impeded the flight crew's ability to keep the airplane on the runway during landing. Regulatory and industry organizations have recognized the importance of preventing opportunities for human error in airplane design and maintenance and provided guidance to manufacturers. These events show the potential for cross-wiring of wheel speed transducers in other airplanes. Therefore, staff has proposed recommendations to the FAA and EASA to identify all certificated, all currently certificated transport category airplanes that did not consider human error in maintenance, which could lead to cross-wiring of anti-skid components and require manufacturers to conduct an assessment and require future air transport category airplanes to assess human error that could lead to cross-wiring of anti-skid components. Both the FAA and EASA have noted that incorporating SMS for designers, manufacturers, and repair stations could help preclude human error in design and maintenance. EASA issued a notice of proposed amendment regarding SMS requirements for manufacturers and repair stations in 2019. Some manufacturers have already started the process of implementation. The FAA plans on issuing a notice of proposed rulemaking in December 2021 requiring implementation of SMS for manufacturers and repair stations. An SMS, if implemented as intended, could aid designers, manufacturers, and maintenance organizations in managing and mitigating risks. As a result, Staff proposes that EASA and FAA require manufacturers, require organizations that design, manufacture, and maintain aircraft to establish an SMS. Next, I will discuss the crew's decision making, leadership, and Pinair's SMS. While the airplane was on base leg of the traffic pattern for runway 13, Reported winds were 300 degrees at 24 knots, and the flight crew expressed surprise on the CVR upon hearing this tailwind. During post-accident interviews with the flight crew, they noted they were aware of SOB's 15-knot tailwind limitation. Despite the flight crew's knowledge of the tailwind limitation, they continued to land the airplane, which was indicative of plan continuation bias, an unconscious bias to continue with the plan despite changing conditions. With plan continuation bias, it becomes stronger as the flight crew gets closer to their destination. Conversations between the first officer and captain show that the captain understood runway 31 was the preferred runway to land based on the wind information. However, the captain demonstrated poor crew resource management for not explicitly sharing his position about runway 31 until after the first officer made a radio transmission about landing on runway 13. After the captain shared his position, the first officer stated his understanding that the airplane would land on runway 13. Then the captain immediately changed his position. The captain demonstrated a lack of flight deck leadership and aeronautical decision-making by allowing the landing of, on a runway 
with a significant tailwind. Pinair had an SMS, which was required by 14 CFR Part 121. However, it was ineffective. For example, the SMS had inadequate controls to detect and prevent company noncompliance with the Pilot in Command Airport Qualification Policy. Consequently, the captain operated at Dutch as a pilot in command without the company required skill and experience level in the Saab 2000. Captain France will discuss the pilot qualification policy in further detail in his presentation. Company management actions that contributed to a punitive safety culture and negative impacts on company morale were present. Additionally, open communication was not fostered. Although pilots could submit reports anonymously, some pilots were uncomfortable with reporting concerns because they thought their concerns would not be addressed or that management would be able to determine who submitted the reports. These organizational factors were inconsistent with SMS. And although Pinair is no longer operating, lessons learned from this investigation can apply to all air carriers. Thank you. Captain France will now continue. Good afternoon. I will discuss operational factors associated with this accident. Specifically, I will look at two elements of FAA oversight relative to this accident. Identification of emerging risks during times of change for an air carrier and the FAA approval process for authorizing carriers to use particular airports. First, I will look at the identification of risks. Beginning in 2012, Pan Air entered a period of expansion, adding routes and bases outside of Alaska. In 2017, these changes began to be reversed. Results of this retraction included a reduction in route structure, the loss of experienced pilots, and ultimately bankruptcy acquisition and merger with another carrier. Just a few months before the accident, two key members of the FAA oversight team, the Principal Operations Inspector, or POI, and his supervisor, the frontline manager, transitioned into their positions. In interviews, both reported they had not previously been involved in air carrier acquisition processes, such as the one that was currently occurring at Pan Air. Neither could point to any emerging risks at the carrier during the transition. The previous POI had used risk assessment tools during the Pan Air bankruptcy and acquisition period. He stated he had initiated some increased surveillance. Despite the increased surveillance, the FAA oversight did not detect one key risk the company had undertaken. The loss of senior pilots had led to an increased need at Pan Air to get additional pilots qualified for select airports like Dutch Harbor. This resulted in the improper application of the company's procedure for qualifying pilots for these airports. For operations to airports that presented particular challenges such as surrounding terrain, complex procedures, shorter runways, or weather concerns, Pan Air required captains to have an additional qualification. To be eligible for the qualification, Pan Air guidance called for the captain to have 300 hours pilot in command time in the Saab 2000. The procedure then required at least one flight to the airport with a Czech airman who evaluated the captain's ability to operate there safely and would then sign a form indicating the captain was qualified to operate to that airport. The 300 hour requirement could be waived to 100 hours if the candidate obtained a letter of recommendation from a Czech airman and a written approval letter from the chief pilot. Since the captain did not have 300 hours PIC time in the Saab, the company intended to qualify him using the waiver provision. And the evaluation flight with the Czech airman was conducted. However, the letters required for the waiver were not produced, and when the qualification form was signed by the Czech airman, the captain did not have 100 hours PIC time in the SOB. The company had misapplied the waiver provision. 
Additionally, the waiver itself was not meant for pilots like the captain, who had low time in the airplane and little experience at the airport. The end result of this unidentified risk was a captain operating to one of the most demanding airports in the Pan Air system with limited experience in the airplane and at the airport. We have proposed a recommendation to the FAA calling for emphasizing the importance of detecting and mitigating risks such as this, which may occur during a period of significant change for the carrier. Another oversight concern related to identifying emerging risk is the rotation of oversight personnel. During the transition to his replacement, the outgoing POI described some informal conversations with the incoming POI, but had no specific safety concerns to pass on. The FAA guidance had no specific procedures to follow to ensure that all information about emerging safety risks for carriers undergoing periods of significant organizational change was passed on when oversight personnel were rotated. When FAA oversight personnel are rotated, a formalized handover procedure is important in identifying and passing on emerging safety risks for a carrier undergoing change. We have proposed a recommendation to the FAA that this process be structured and specifically detailed by the provision of written guidance for this type of rotation. Finally, I will discuss the other aspect of FAA oversight related to this case, the approval of airports for a carrier's use. Runways are constructed with runway safety areas, or RSAs, that include extensions at the ends that are designed to limit damage in the event of an overrun. The length of these areas is specified in FAA runway design guidance and is determined by the needs of the largest and fastest airplane normally expected to use the runway. For example, airplanes with a higher landing speed would need a longer runway safety area to slow down and stop if they inadvertently went past the end of the runway on landing. This slide depicts the runway safety areas at each end of the Dutch Harbor runway. As a reminder, the accident airplane landed on runway 13, beginning at the left of the photo. The 300-foot runway safety area at Dutch Harbor was not suitable for an airplane with the landing speed of the Saab 2000. Runways designed to accommodate airplanes like the Saab should have 1,000 feet of safety area beyond the end of the runway. The existing runway safety area provided significantly reduced safety margin for an aircraft like the Saab 2000. Based on interviews, neither Pan Air nor the FAA were aware of this mismatch between the runway safety area the Saab would need and the runway safety area at Dutch Harbor. The performance study for this accident indicated that the accident airplane would have been able to stop on the paved surface of the runway safety area had it been a suitable length. As part of their oversight responsibilities, the FAA issues operations specifications to air carriers that authorize airports for their use. There is no guidance provided to FAA inspectors to consider the size of the runway safety area when they approve an airport for use by an air carrier. Since an appropriate runway safety area would have been a significant mitigating factor in this accident, we are recommending that the FAA consider this item when it approves airports for a carrier's use. This concludes staff presentation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McGladry, Dr. Civilian, and Captain France for your excellent presentations, and thank you for all your work on this investigation. We'll now turn to board member questions focused on the key safety issues in this accident. First, flight crew performance and organizational factors. Second, the brake system and system safety. Third, FAA oversight. And fourth, any other safety issues board members would like to raise. 
Some members may have comments on every safety issue, some may not. The purpose of this discussion and focused deliberation is to highlight those areas where we believe we can make the most impact in improving safety. The Vice Chairman Landsberg, would you like to begin the discussion on flight crew performance and organizational factors? Thank you, uh, Chairman Hominy. So, um, could we get the uh, statement uh, or restate the last wind that was given to the flight crew on short final and what the accident, the actual wind was at the time of touchdown? Um, I believe I can address that. The, the flight crew right around one minute before uh, the landing requested the winds from the Dutch Harbor Weather Observer. They received a wind of 300 uh, degrees at 24 knots. The performance study compared the uh, touchdown air, the airspeed right at touchdown with the ground speed, and I believe that value was 15 knots of tailwind. So the, the captain was aware that he was outside the operating parameters uh, uh, approved for the aircraft. Is that a fair statement, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Civilian? Yes, that is a fair statement, and we, we also were able to confirm his knowledge of the 15 knot tailwind uh, during interviews. So, um, Captain Franz, um, would the flight have been able to stop on the runway if the brakes had functioned properly? I believe that is the conclusion of the uh, performance study that was done for this aircraft. I can. Uh, I can ask our performance expert to um, answer that, uh, certainly, if you would like. Thank you. Yes, Vice Chairman, the performance study found that the aircraft would be expected to stop if it had a fully functional wheel brake and anti-skid system. Okay. Um, what was the captain's total experience for flights in and out of uh, a Dutch harbor? Um, the captain had a wide experience in Alaska in interviews, he estimated that his total operation to Dutch Harbor prior to joining Pan Air was about 20 times in another airplane, another type of airplane. And since he had joined Pan Air, we counted nine trips he had made to Dutch Harbor in the Saab 2000. So he'd been flying though in a different aircraft, the uh, Dash 8, I believe it was. Um, What's the difference in the landing speed between those two aircraft? Uh, it, it is significant in interviews. The captain described a couple times how it was a slower, more maneuverable airplane, the Dash 8, which was what he had spent most of his Alaska career flying. Um, it, the Dash 8 weighs about 70% uh, of what the Saab does, and it takes about 70% of the runway up on landing that the Saab would I wasn't able to find an exact number of uh, approach speed for the dash to compare with the Saab, but it would be significantly less on the order of at least 10 and potentially more knots less than this airspeed of the Saab for landing. So that would account for the different requirement for the runway safety areas then? Correct. The, the, the runway safety areas are specified for particular classes and, and types of designations of airplanes and the, the type of airplane the captain had flown, the Dash was a, a category B approach airplane, meaning that was its approach speed category was B, the Saab was a C, which is a higher approach speed category. So uh, one last question for this round, uh, Dr. Civilian. Um, the captain seemed to be a little ambivalent uh, on his decision here. Uh, first, he looked like he was going to, after they uh, did the go around, he was going to go uh, and land on runway 31 and then changed his mind. Um, any any thoughts on that? I mean, that that would have resolved this whole issue if he'd said, okay, that didn't work. Let's, let's try something different. What the evidence suggested was that there was a lack of uh, crew resource management. Uh, and in terms of his decision making, uh, there, there was a conversation uh, that we heard on the CBR in which the first officer had asked him, uh, you know, what, you know, what do you want to do here? You know, should we continue? And he didn't really receive a response from uh, the captain. And so uh, the result was they, they continued on uh, to land on runway 13. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Uh, Member Graham. Thank you, Chair Hominy. Uh, gentlemen, we uh, you stated that pretty much the winds, uh, if they if they weren't either crosswind, there was a tailwind component to these winds uh, most of the time during both attempts at approach. Would that be correct? It would be correct to say that for the after the first go around and as he was making the traffic pattern circuit to return to land twice the winds are reported to them as almost a direct tailwind component earlier in the flight they had there had been a mixture of various winds reported some included a crosswind and tailwind component yes so normally a crosswind up using one three um the uh Tailwind limitation is in the Saab flight manual. I know we mentioned something in the report about the company flight manual. Do we mean the, the aircraft flight manual or is this a separate company manual? The company flight manual is basically an, ad an adaption of the Saab manual uh, with the company's name and, and stamp of approval essentially put on it. But it's it's all the information in it is drawn from the manufacturer's manual. So it's the, the Saab's limit, but it was published in the company flight manual. Great, thank you for that. Um, I went through the interviews quite extensively for both crew members, uh, very interested. Um, what did they say about the winds on their approach in general? Neither crew member could specifically recall uh, winds that they received after the go around or, or before. They, they were able to describe a range and a general direction they thought they had heard the winds were from, but neither could specifically say they received uh, a wind from this degree or this uh, direction at this specific value. I agree. And I, and I read in the transcript, I noticed a lot of times they were talking about a right to left crosswind all the time, that that's what they were seeing most of the time. And uh, it didn't seem like they, they, I know they were very busy, on their second approach, it doesn't appear that uh, that even in in the interview that they wanted to acknowledge that they did hear the ground observer call the winds three zero zero at twenty four on their short base leg about I think it was about a minute twenty seconds before their landing, um, but yet the CVR recording states otherwise that they did acknowledge it uh, significantly with some of their wording of oh God and some other words that came out of that. Um, and I've got to say, I, I really, I, I kind of struggle with this. It's really easy for us to sit here and armchair quarterback this situation from the comfort of our office. And it's not that any, that any of us haven't ever landed with the uh, tailwind, maybe unintentionally and hopefully uh, not intentionally, unless that's all that was available. But um, as a professional pilot, I struggle with this situation to continue to land with the tailwind especially on a short runway, knowing that landing distance is an issue. I know as a pilot myself, we spend a, much of our training practicing for that one time, once in a career emergency that we hope never happens. And uh, you never know when it might happen. And it, but it's better off in training, especially in the simulator. If you, if you see this, have seen it before, practice it, and so you might recognize it quicker, uh, respond appropriately, and hopefully have a more effective and positive outcome from it. I think a lot of times we call this, we would like to call this expect the unexpected, right? As a pilot, you're always expecting the unexpected. But to me, it's, it's more than that. When I started my aviation career, I thankfully learned early on to take the most conservative approach all the time, because you never know when that unexpected might happen. And I like to call that respect the unexpected. The reason being is you always want to set yourself up for success. And in this case, this crew didn't do that. They had a short runway, a higher landing speed than what they were normally used to in other aircraft. And yet they took a significant tailwind landing. And unfortunately, if they would have taken the headwind, it probably would have resulted in a good landing and hopefully not extended off the end of the runway going the opposite direction. So I see my time is up. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Member Graham. Member Chapman. 
Thank you, Chair Hamidi, and uh, thanks to our team. Uh, excellent work on this uh, investigation. Uh, some of the questions I'm about to ask ha have already been asked or the information has been covered. I'm going to ask in maybe just a little bit different way, but I apologize for covering some of the material that you all have already discussed. So while the aircraft was on the base leg of the VFR traffic pattern for what, runway 1-3, um, apparently the crew sought and received a wind check from the airport weather observer, and that wind check indicated a 24-knot tailwind. Is that correct? That's correct. And approximately how long prior to touchdown did the crew receive that information? I believe, as um, Member Graham stated, about an, a minute and 20 seconds, somewhere between a minute and a minute and a half before touchdown was when they received the final wind information. Okay. And, and am I correct? They were on the base leg of the traffic pattern? In as much as you could describe it as a base leg, it was the, the traffic pattern at that airport, as you know, is basically a big circle around okay. Mount Ballyhoo. So it wasn't rectangular per se, but yeah, I, it was. It was. It would be fair to state that they were on the a base section, yeah. and or getting ready to turn final. When yeah, they roughly speaking, on the on the base leg. Um, and do we do we know approximately what altitude above ground level they were at the time they received that report? I do not know that information. I don't know if anyone else would have that at hand or not. Um, and that's fine. That's I, I, to me the the more significant issue is the they receive this information relatively close in time to the point of touchdown, um, and that I believe was the last information they had with respect to the wind. They, they had information in hand that indicated a 24 knot tailwind. So it's my understanding that our calculation you've indicated this that our calculation indicates the tailwind was 15 knots at the time of touchdown, and that's correct. Correct. Would the crew <clears throat> would the crew have had any way to know that uh, the tailwind would be 15 knots at the time of touchdown? They would not have, would they? I would say no, they would not. And we have no reason to think that they did know it was 15 knots at the time of touchdown. Correct. So what they knew was that there was a prevailing tailwind close in time to touchdown that was very likely um, greater than the limits of the aircraft. Yes. This is for my own curiosity. Um, I was a music major in college, so I don't have the knowledge of physics to understand uh, uh, all of this. Um, uh, I want to ask you about the the 15 knot tailwind at the time of touchdown versus the 24 knot tailwind or the approximate 24 knot tailwind at the time of um, final approach. Um, how much impact would the apparently higher tailwind of 24 knots have had on the forward energy of the aircraft that touched down? In other words, what's more significant? the tailwind at the time of touchdown or the tailwind on final approach with respect to the amount of forward energy the aircraft would have been carrying into a uh, touchdown on the runway. So from an energy perspective, uh, the airplane ground speed is what matters when we talk about airplane stopping distance and braking capability. So the, the tailwind uh, is contributing to the ground speed uh, throughout the entire time frame that the airplane is airborne prior to main gear touchdown. Uh, after that, the tailwind contributes uh, to reduced retarding effects in terms of both aerodynamic drag and engine reverse power. Uh, but in terms of the analysis of the energy, energy state of the aircraft and the tailwind, it's accounted for in the airplane performance group study uh, by way of the aircraft main gear touchdown location, uh, the initial airspeed, uh, I, I should say the, air, the corresponding airspeed air at that point, excuse me, as well as the corresponding ground speed at that point. That becomes the initial condition. So it, it contributes to the definition of both the 
distance the airplane travels in the air over the runway, uh, as well as the actual main gear touchdown point. Okay, that's helpful, very helpful. Uh, last question, I apologize, I'm a little bit over here. Given what we know about the loss of braking and the parameters of the aircraft's performance, would it have been possible for the crew to stop the aircraft on the runway had they made this, the decision to land on the opposite runway 31? That is landing into a headwind rather than landing as they did on runway 13 with an excessive tailwind? The short answer is yes. Uh, we did a, a thorough analysis looking at both flap and runway selection. Uh, either flap selection or runway selection or tailwind versus headwind contributes to lowering the energy state of the aircraft. Um, so we would expect that the airplane could have stopped if it had landed at uh, flaps 20 or 35 on the opposite runway, on runway 31, or if it had landed on runway 13 at flaps 35. Even Everything if else had, being equal. Even if there had been a similar loss of braking. That is correct. Uh, thank you all very much. I apologize for going over. All right, thank you, uh, Member Chapman, and thank you, Vice Chairman Landsberg and Member Graham for excellent questions. I wanted to follow up for some context uh, for those who are uh, viewing this and have not read the draft report. I do have some questions regarding the, the crew communication. And first, I, I just want to ask, at about 4.57 p.m., the captain stated that the wind, and this is uh, this is uh, about 43 minutes before the accident. The captain stated that the wind was starting to favor the back door a little more. What does that mean? Um, front door and back door are colloquial terms used by Pen Air and probably other pilots of flight at Dutch Harbor, but they involve visual pathways into either runway 13, which is called the front door, and uh, runway 31, which is called the back door. So if he said it's starting to favor the back door, he would be implying it's starting to favor runway 31. Right. So he, he, he had stated that the wind was starting to favor the back door a little more, indicating maybe they should consider runway 31. And over the next 40 minutes, the, the weather had changed pretty significantly. On the first landing attempt and decision to go around, uh, another flight crew, which was heard on the CVR, was told that the wind was from 290 at 16 knots with gusts to 30 knots. And just before the second landing attempt, the flight crew learned from the weather observer that the midfield uh, was at about 24 knots, well above the aircraft performance limits of 15 knots. So should the flight crew have land first, should the flight crew have landed uh on uh, one three or gone for the back door and went for runway 31, three one. In, in my analysis, I determined regarding operational factors that the better choice would have been for the crew to return after the go around return and land on runway three one. Right. And so at some point there, uh, the captain stated, if there are any changes in the wind, then we'll just switch runways. We'll switch runways. And then at some point after, you know, on the landing attempts that if it gets too sheery, just say, go around and we'll go out the back door. And the officer said, it had said, go around. And so the captain aborted the landing. And then on the second attempt at the landing, the captain stated, three one twice and the first officer questioned that three one captain then questioned back door which would indicate then a landing on runway three one and the first officer said i thought we were, we were doing one three the captain responded oh okay sure we'll try again and added i was thinking about going the other way 
during the post-accident interview, the first officer stated that the wind check information didn't ind- did not indicate that the planned runway for landed- landing needed to change, even though we know it did, in fact, need to change. What was your, uh, you know, what? What did you think about the communication to the crew and uh, between the crew and what would you expect uh, on communication uh, between crew and this type of uh, crew members in this situation? I will let Dr. Civilian uh, follow up with his response to that. I'll just briefly say uh, a go around is a, is a, a largely unpracticed and high workload uh, situation. I would have expected a little more of a a breath by the crew and to consider the situation and to have at least a complete discussion about which runway would be suitable. I I characterized both their discussions uh, shortly after the go around and then um, shortly before the landing when they were aware of winds and talking about which runway they might want to use. Uh, They were both cursory in that they were short, incomplete, reached no definitive conclusions and it ended up basically following the plan that uh, had been in place from, you know, several minutes or several, uh, quite a while out on the approach to land on 1-3. They just continued with that plan, did not follow through with any reconsideration when they learned of the, uh, the adverse conditions. Captain Franz, thank you. Dr. Civilian, could you talk a little bit more about plan continuation bias? We saw this uh, earlier this year when we considered the Calabasas uh, investigation report. Can you talk about that more? Yes, so plan continuation bias is a unconscious bias to continue with the plan despite changing conditions. In this case, the crew was aware of the different uh, uh, changes in wind in wind direction and also velocity uh, based on the Dutch Harbor Weather Observer information. Uh, but in the case of the 300 degrees at 24 knots uh, that they received that information, both of them were aware of it. Uh, the captain uh, said last try uh, after communicating with the first officer. Uh, and that's that process of, uh, we, we learned about that in the CVR. We also learned uh, that both pilots were aware of the 15 knot tailwind limitation uh, from Saab. So taking all of that into consideration, uh, it's it's part of that plan continuation bias that not only did the crew know of the 15 knot tailwind limitation, but the CVR helped us understand a bit more about uh, their knowledge of that 300 degrees at 24 knot uh, uh, tailwind. So that, that helps us understand a bit more about plane continuation bias. Thank you very much. So we'll move to a uh, second round of uh, questioning on flight crew performance and organizational factors. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Uh, no further questions at uh, this time, uh, Ch- Chair Hammondy. Thank you very much. Member Graham. Chair, I don't have any further questions on this safety uh, subject. Thank you. Okay, great. Member Chapman. And no further questions for me in this area. Thank you. Okay, I I just have a a few other questions. Um, Can you talk about the flight risk assessment, what was not on the assessment, and uh, what that information might have uh, provided? Well, the flight risk assessment was a form the captain was required to fill out because Dutch Harbor was designated as a special airport. And um, there were several items on the flight risk assessment not marked by the captain that would have indicated there was an elevated risk for the flight. One was a uh, crew member with the uh, company less than a year. Both pilots had been with Penn Air less than a year, but that was not marked on the, uh, on the risk assessment form. Uh, another was destination airport more than two hours away, not marked, but but Dutch Harbor was more than a two hour flight. And uh, there was a, a, a what's called a runway risk value for uh, select airports, including Dutch Harbor. And you were supposed to, on the risk assessment form, you were to enter 
the number of that particular airport for that uh, runway risk value, and that was not entered uh, on the form either. So the ultimate result was the, the captain came up with a lower number on the risk assessment form than he would have had it been correctly filled out. Uh, so, and just uh, if it was correctly filled out, it would have been caution, but it didn't still didn't require management approval. It just would have maybe signaled there was some caution. Correct. It would. I think the intent of the form would have been to raise awareness of the challenges of the flight a little higher because the number itself was higher, even though, as you stated, it didn't rise to the level that the Pen Air manual required approval from management level for the flight. Okay, great. And, and uh, uh, lastly, I just want to, um, well, two, two last questions. Why did Pen, why did Pen Air uh, have a pilot and command airport qualification requirement for Dutch Harbor? I know you mentioned it in your presentation, but if you can mention it one more time. They had the requirement for, for three of the airports they flew to, um, and the, the requirement was driven by special concerns or additional challenges presented by some of these airports. In the case of Dutch Harbor, the, 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 the challenges were numerous. One was the terrain and that the airport was right at the foot of a large mountain surrounded by water or, or water on each end of the runway. The runway was fairly short. The wind patterns, especially the wind patterns because of the mountain were known to be irregular and often challenging for crews. So they designated Pan Air designated that airport as one that required special attention, special designation for their, before one of their captains could actually operate there. And my final question for, thank you, Captain Franz. And my final question for Dr. Civilian on this uh, a safety issue is at some point we're gonna talk about SMS and I want to uh, talk about that with respect to Saab and manufacturers and designers. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about Penair's SMS, and if you could just talk about what we mean by effective SMS. In this case, uh, you you had said SMS if implemented as intended. And so, what 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 happened here with Penair with their uh, safety management system? Yes, uh, the Penair uh, SMS was ineffective, and when we say Ineffective, we're talking uh, in particular to the four components of SMS. Um, and, and so that, when we looked at the uh, issues that were brought up in their SMS, uh, we determined that there were several issues um, that pilots uh, experienced uh, with respect to um, submitting concerns, safety concerns. Uh, so some of the pilots were concerned about their uh, information being anonymous, if it, if it wasn't going to be anonymous. Uh, so there were a lot of issues that we saw there in terms of uh, not only uh, safety policy in terms of the uh, pilot qualification policy that uh, Captain France discussed, but also in terms of safety assurance, um, safety risk management and safety promotion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you both. Uh, just want to make sure did any other members have questions on this safety issue? Yeah, feel free to turn your camera on. If not, at the end of, of all the safety issues, we'll come back and make sure if anyone wants to follow up on any issue, you can in that last, certainly can in that last round. Okay, so not seeing any, we will begin our discussion on brake system and system safety with Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. How long had this aircraft been in service uh, after the brake overhaul? Uh, it went into service at the end of July, so about four months. So four months. Well, the, the, the landing gear was overhauled in January 2017, uh, and it was stored up until July uh, of 2019. So it didn't fly during that period then, is that correct? So it was, but it was an active service for four months. Yes. So 
Is it possible in routine operation that the brakes were never applied hard enough uh, to be able to a activate uh, the anti-skid function and thus the, the fault obviously went undetected? Is that possible? Uh, well, we looked at the uh, we looked at four months of records of the of the maintenance uh, diagnostic computer, and there was only one case where the the fault was recorded. Um, but there was uh, there was uh, a record of uh, flat spots on tires and, and replacements of tires. Uh. More than what one would have normally expected uh, on on an aircraft like this. Uh, you know, after for four months, it was only one additional tire replacement um, okay. for, for each one. So there wasn't really a, the ability to develop a trend there. Okay. Um, this is for uh, Dr. Civilian. Uh, any uh, thoughts regarding the captain's uh, aeronautical decision making in, in light of the fact that this is a really unusual circumstance? Uh, and, and I want to also echo... Uh, uh, member Graham's comments about uh, the um, uh, armchair quarterbacking uh, as a pilot myself. I'm keenly aware that in the heat of the moment, you don't oftentimes have a lot of time to sort of sort through things. Yes, we looked at the uh, decision making of fun landing. Uh, and given that this particular uh, breaking issue, uh, system issue, was a latent failure, uh, the crew's decision. Uh, upon landing it was is, is what we had expected um, in, in terms of uh, them trying to uh, stop the airplane. Okay. Is there any requirement to dynamically test an entire brake system or any emergency system for that matter after maintenance? It's, uh, it's common uh, to do post uh, installation uh, tests when you, in, for instance, install the landing gear. In this case, the, the procedures do not have any tests uh, that would have uh, detected this cross-wiring condition. So there was no test that recommended by the manufacturer, Saab, to deliberately apply the brakes hard enough after this, this uh, aircraft came out of storage and maintenance to see if, in fact, the braking system was, was fully functional. Do I understand that correctly? Yes, there's no operational uh, test of, of, of these, this type of thing. There, is a, there was a simple uh, functional check of, this, of the anti-skid system that if you had connected up the sensors, uh, it, it would have passed, but uh, it would not have detected the, the sensors being crossed. And I think we've got a recommendation to that effect uh, at some point. Am I remembering correctly? We have recommendations uh, about the redesign to reduce the likelihood. And we also, Dr. Civilian also has a recommendation uh, out to uh, other airplanes models. Okay. okay. Uh, it was just one other thing that I was looking at this. Um, you know, this this uh, particular circumstance is, really does fall into the uh, definition of an accident, something that's somewhat unforeseen. Uh, I asked the staff to prepare a um, uh, kind of a list of how many uh, propeller separations that we had that uh, penetrated the cabin. And um, what we came up with, uh, and this was sort of a back of the envelope thing, was about uh, seven, I believe, in 37 years. And I could only find one injury that I looked at. Um, any uh, any comments on that, um, uh, Dr. Silva? Sure. Um, we, we did um, discuss this. It is, in terms of propeller separation, um, that is something that goes into certification. That is a consideration that goes into certification. As you said, there weren't um, that many and only one or, uh, or two over 40 years resulted in serious injury. So um, not necessarily a consistent trend there. Specifically for this accident, the propeller departure from the engine um, had to do with leaving the, the paved surface. And so the focus of our our report and our investigation really had to do with how do we keep airplanes on a paved surface um, 
as opposed to uh, occupant safety necessarily, if it goes outside of. of the Understand. Um, I just make an, maybe an improper observation that maybe the, the sitting directly opposite the plane of the propeller is maybe not the best place to sit, and it's certainly the most noisy. So, uh, anyway, uh, uh, my apologies for going over. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman Landsberg and Member Graham. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to go back to the cross wiring on brakes. Um, so, if I understand correctly, the cross wiring itself would not trigger a fault. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so what condition has to happen for that to generate a fault? The uh, the airplane would have to skid, and the anti-skid system would have to be commanding a full brake release for greater than two seconds uh, for a fault message to occur. And it's kind of a cryptic fault message that doesn't point to cross-wiring. It's just a generic type of fault message. Yeah, I wanted people to understand that because I, was, I too, was like the vice chair trying to wonder, figure out how this plane had been flying for four months. But... The fault message itself, where where, and who would see the fault message on that? Well, under this circumstance, there would be an anti-skid fault, which would be displayed on the ICAST display, accompanied with a master caution uh, on landing or when it, when it occurs, um, which occurred in this, in this accident. Uh, but the, the, the fault would have been stored in the maintenance diagnostic computer for the mechanics uh, later to look at. Okay, so if a mechanic sees this fault, uh, what does it tell him and what can he do about it per the maintenance manual? Uh, so again, this, it only occurred once, but uh, there there's no troubleshooting procedure uh, for the fault message. Um, I think originally the fault was, uh, it wasn't to detect cross wiring, it was to detect malfunction of an anti skid control unit. So uh, the manufacturer crane uh, said, if, if I'm commanding, if I'm in the anti skid box and I'm commanding uh, 1.5 seconds for the, for the brakes to be released and it's not doing it, then the anti skid control unit uh, is faulty. But there's no troubleshooting procedure. Um, it would be difficult for a mechanic very difficult for a mechanic to figure out that it was caused by cross wiring. Yeah, exactly. So the mechanic really has no clue of what to do with this. And it's not like a flight crew can see a cross wiring on a pre-flight. Yeah, exactly. No. So um, since this uh, happened, Saab took several post action accident actions, including addition of fittings on test testing equipment, during overhaul, a service bulletin to the operators to inspect for incorrect wiring, wirings and adding uh, and added a new inspection procedure. Does staff believe that SOB's post-accident actions are sufficient to protect against cross-wiring issue or basically from this happening again, having a cross-wiring issue? Well, we think their initiative of the of SOB and the regulators were excellent. Uh, develop the test procedure, initiate uh, the inspections. Uh, however, there's nothing done to address the labeling problem on the wire harnesses. Uh, we you know when we removed these harnesses from the airplane, the accident airplane, after only four months of service, the labels labels on many of them were unreadable. And even after cleaning the extensive grime. Uh, it's a very harsh environment. Uh, we think there's a great opportunity here to improve the labeling of the harnesses, especially in the area where it matters, near the transducer. Uh, or, by the way, they're very protected uh, from the elements inside the axle if our label were placed down near the transducer. So we, is, we believe a simple label there, or even better, like a color coding scheme would ensure a proper installation without affecting interchangeability of the transducers. It's, uh, I think it's low-hanging fruit there. So you're concerned not just at the top, but also at the bottom where the connections are, correct? Yes. That's that's what I'm hearing. And I know coming from a, uh, being with a former manufacturer too, I know other things that could be done, maybe just not labeling and coloring, but you can actually change, change the connectors themselves to where the wrong one won't fit in, in the improper side. I know that's one of the things they have there. 
Um, thank you for that. Uh, I have a few more questions on this uh, safety issue, but I see I'm out of time. So back to you, uh, Chair Hominy. Thank you, Member Graham. Member Chapman. Thank you, Chair. Um, in the wake of this accident, airworthiness directives were issued in both Europe and the United States. And those uh, ADs require, as I understand it, require inspections of the landing gear uh, brake system wiring on the existing fleet. Um, I, I'm told that there are a limited number of these aircraft still in service. Is that correct? I, I'm, I'm told it's less than less than 10 maybe. Saab told us there are, there are actually 45 uh, out there. Not not all of them are in service. Um, do we know whether other cross-wired Saab 2000 aircraft have been identified as a result of the AD required inspections? Saab reported that 30 had they'd gotten feedback that 30 had completed of the 45 have had completed the. Uh, inspection and they, they hadn't received any feedback about uh, additional findings. Okay. Um, now, a, a component manufacturer called APPH Limited manufactured the main landing gear wire harnesses. Did APPH also design the wire harnesses or did APPH manufacture the harnesses according to Saab's specifications? In other words, who designed the wire harnesses? Uh, so, uh, APPH was the designer of the, the wire harnesses, but they, they had to meet the specification of Saab to. Um, there was clearly Saab labeling on, on, the, on the harnesses. So. And the reason I ask this question is our, our probable cause refers specifically to Saab's design. And I believe we're also going to consider a recommendation to Saab about the design. Um, it, it, is there a need to evaluate the probable cause or the recommendation and include the component manufacturer as well? I, I believe that, that Saab is ultimately responsible for the the markings on the on the harness, and I think it's appropriate to to. Uh, Directed, maybe directed at them. Uh, Dr. Silva, did you want to comment? Nope, that's actually exactly the point I wanted to make. Saab okay. has all responsibility here. Great, thank you. Thanks. Uh, are there other um, aircraft model types other than the Saab 2000 with similar landing gear designs or components, which are likewise subject to potential cross wiring? Uh, we, we certainly found, and, and Dr. Civilian spoke about that, that we found three other cases that we investigated that were indeed. Uh, um, so we, we, although this airplane did have a somewhat unique uh, in terms of large transport airplanes of this paired management of, of, uh, of anti-skid uh, system, uh, it's certainly not, uh, other designs are certainly susceptible and have equally uh, problematic failure modes. Um, and, and are we aware what those model types are? Uh, we we did some. We we did we weren't able to do a comprehensive uh, analysis of uh, all of the airplanes that had uh, paired management, but uh, there's a number of of uh, like a Beach 1900. Um, and others that uh, some King Airs uh, that have similar designs. Should <clears throat> should uh, FAA or EASA call on operators of air of other aircraft models uh, to inspect for potential cross wiring situations? Dr. Civilian, would you like to comment? To uh, in terms of the uh, system safety aspects, we have made a recommendation. Uh, to FAA and EASA to have them uh, look at uh, transport category airplanes that have not looked into this type of failure mode and have them assess that failure mode. And then even for future aircraft, uh, future airplanes that are designed to also look at this type of failure mode. 
And you think the recommendations will, uh, and I'm not arguing the point, I really am just curious. I want to make sure we're on the right track here. The recommendations we'll consider today on that point are broad enough to cover not just aircraft going forward, newly newly designed, newly manufactured aircraft going forward, but also aircraft that are in the existing fleet? Absolutely, because um, given the, uh, there are differences in landing gear and braking uh, systems, uh, and ice skate systems, uh, we want to be able to have that opportunity to see if, if there are some even unique situations here uh, where there could be a possibility of, uh, or the potential of a cross-wiring event. That's helpful, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. McGladry, you state that the uh, incorrect wheel speed transduce, transducer, or, or our report draft report states, the uh, Cross wiring most likely occurred during the overhaul of the left main landing gear at the landing gear manufacturer's facility in January 2017, more than two and a half years before the accident. It, the uh, Pen Air's first revenue flight wasn't until June 2019, uh, but but um, this occurred on Octo in October 2019. Why didn't this occur before now? Why, why on that day in October, on October 17, 2019, between June and October, the plane was operational, but why on that day? Well, it is, uh, it's a function of uh, a skid condition. So the pilots applied uh, enough brake pressure to cause the tire to skid uh, the left Either if it was the left left outboard or the left inboard tire to skid, it would have created this condition. So up until that point, um, th th there wasn't uh, enough brake pressure applied to cause it to skid and burst. Um, was there anything anyone wanted to add? I saw their cameras go on, so I just wanted to make sure. Mr. Yes, I was just going to add that there was one previous event recorded at on Alaska in terms of an FDR event related to anti-skid. So it's not the first time that an anti-skid right. event was flagged. It's not the first time that a wheel skid occurred, but it may right. have been relieved. Yeah. As, okay. as Mr. McLeodry noted. Yes, Ms. Mr. Renzi correctly noted that it was actually four days earlier on a flight into Dutch Harbor, there was a, there was a anti-skid control fault uh, recorded. Okay. And uh, do we know, I know that on one of the tires we found that there was damage, uh, wear and other deterioration. Uh, it was a, uh, a, a bald spot, the cord was not showing, uh, but pen air procedures, um, uh, didn't require the flight crew to take any further action regarding the tire, but the Saab 2000 aircraft man maintenance manual did. Uh, I'm not sure why they had two different uh, procedures. Maybe you can address that, but could you also address uh, whether, and the captain and first officer had noted some damage to this tire, did that have any effect on uh, this accident at all? I guess I'll, I'll, I'll address the tire uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, Captain Franz can address the pilot uh, aspect. Uh, we don't believe that the, that the, the bald spot or flat spot uh, noticed by the first officer before the accident flight uh, contributed to, to the tire burst. Uh, the amount of tread that needs to be worn away to get from uh, the level of uh, tread depth that it had and the flat spot is is very small relative to the total construction of the tire. So we think that uh, it, it wasn't a factor. And uh, Captain France, did you want to address the, uh, the pilot criteria for? Certainly, I'll just briefly say Penair's guidance to the crews for uh, inspecting the tires was less than comprehensive. And um, in interviews, we discovered that 
different pilots had different ideas. Many of them were shared, though, about what would constitute the necessity to make a maintenance report about a tire's condition. Uh, the, a short list of things were like if there was cord showing through the tire, the tread was completely gone. Um, there were pieces of rubber or chunks missing from the tire. That, that would necessitate a report to maintenance. Some pilots said a flat spot. This pilot, the captain, said he was aware of the flat spot, but because cord was not showing through, there was still rubber on the tire. It hadn't reached the base level yet. Um, he thought it was uh, still serviceable. It did not elect to forward it to maintenance for their consideration. Thank you very much. I, I'd just say, and because I'm out of out of time, and we'll go to another round, uh, that I was a little bit surprised that Michelin. Uh, Air, who, who manufactured the tire, had recommended daily inspections, and Pen Air had um, uh, uh, inspections every seven days of the tire. So that was surprising because it was a difference than what the manufacturer had recommended. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm out of time for my round. So let me ask if Vice Chairman uh, Landsberg has additional questions in this area. Uh, not a question, just a comment. And that is that uh, in the in, across the industry, we've seen periodically problems with uh, maintenance, getting things miswired or crossed and way beyond just brakes and flight controls and other things. The Beach 1900 uh, crash in uh, uh, Charlotte, uh, South, uh, North Carolina uh, was one. And there have been other crashes in, in light aircraft involving uh, engine uh, air induction filters that have been installed backwards. So um, I would hope that as a result of this and some others that the manufacturing community and the FAA would take this as a uh, stepping stone to start looking at, as Member Graham and Member Chapman have suggested, that you cannot in design, you should design something so you cannot install it incorrectly. I know in my own uh, maintenance of various and sundry things, that's been very helpful to me in uh, making sure that I got the job done properly. Uh, no further questions, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chairman Landsberg. Member Graham. Thank you, uh, Chair Homedy. Sorry, there we go. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about system safety assessments and, and the fact that uh, Saab initially did not uh, uh, determine that there would there was a hazard of a human being able to crosswire uh, this uh, anti skid system. And um, can you talk about how safety engineers analyze the risk and hazards due to human error when they perform system safe safety assessments? Yes, uh, system safety assessments, uh, as I stated before, I have uh, contain several different types of uh, analyses. Uh, one of those uh, assessments is a functional hazard assessment. And part of that process is breaking down the functions of the system and understanding the associated failures, uh, effects, uh, and causes, uh, and then usually we're assigning a, um, uh, a, a severity uh, or even probability uh, for that. Uh, so in terms of maintenance human error, uh, Saab had requirements, certification requirements to look into maintenance human error. Uh, and when you're looking at a functional hazard assessment, one of the things that you would do is you would uh, ask yourself, what sorts of failures or combination of failures uh, could occur because of a mechanic making a mistake, say, in maintenance, in this case, overhaul. Uh, these risks uh, can be uh, assessed qualitative from a qualitative standpoint. Uh, and the benefit of that is uh, it's a downstream effect uh, where maintenance instructions could be looked at uh, and then determine if those maintenance instructions are uh, adequate. The upstream effect uh, uh, in terms of the flight crew is concerned, they would be uh, aware of such a uh, system related issue and be able to uh, make some decisions uh, before takeoff uh, and before landing. Uh, so it's, it's important that uh, you know, an assessment like that is completed by safety engineers uh, to help them understand 
really what, what, what type of risk am I looking at uh, in terms of the system, uh, but also uh, if, the, if there's a maintenance human error, what does that look like as, as well um, for that standpoint? Thank you. And I'm quite aware that um, system safety assessments uh, have become, or I should maybe say, have matured considerably over the years when it comes to new aircraft design. And uh, it has become quite a big and extensive part of uh, new aircraft development and certification. Can you, we have a recommendation in this report that's come to the board about um, developers and manufacturers and maintainers to have a safety management system. And can you tell me how an SMS would uh, help a system safety assessment in say a manufacturer? How would an SMS help make that more effective? Yes, typically a system safety assessment uh, is conducted as part of certification. Uh, and when, when a manufacturer uh, puts these together, it's normally uh, as part of an engineering function. So that particular engineering group is putting, putting that assessment together. Uh, and they have their uh, oversight at that, at that level. An SMS for manufacturers uh, is at, uh, can be at an enterprise level. So at the company level, which is another set of eyes looking at that system safety assessment and those particular analyses uh, within that assessment to understand uh, number one, in considering these components of SMS, safety risk management, safety assurance, for example, uh, are the risks, in this case, uh, a cross-wiring event? Uh, did we adequately, adequately uh, look into the uh, effects uh, or severity of a, of, a, of a type of situation? So these are just some of the things that uh, an SMS for manufacturers can provide that enterprise oversight over these assessments which is beneficial. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Civilian. Uh, Chair Hominy, that's all the questions I have on this safety subject. Thank you. Thank you. Member Chapman. Thank you, Chair Hominy. No further questions for me in this area. Thank you very much. I just, just have a up just for a second, Dr. Civilian, because I know that there are some especially uh, uh, families and friends of, of loved ones who were impacted uh, by this tragedy. And I, I just want, if you could, we often talk about uh, issues that we're familiar with. So if you could talk about certification, what that is, why it's important, and how the safety assessment fits into that process. I just want to make sure people understand, especially if you don't have an aviation background, that, that our, our viewers understand what this means. Yes, uh, as part of the certification process, which is, and I'll say this, a very important part uh, uh, of the process is the system safety assessment, uh, because you're looking at uh, several uh, different types of hazards uh, that could occur uh, within the system when it, before it gets initial certification. So, Having an understanding of what those hazards really are uh, helps in the beginning of the design cycle uh, as the design matures uh, throughout that process, we know more about the effects that that hazard could have on uh, flight safety. So it's, it's very important that when these analyses are reviewed uh, by regulatory agencies, uh, that a particular um, eye into the maintenance related errors, maintenance human error that could occur, uh, and then that effect of that error and, and what it could and how it could impact the flight crew performance. Uh, and so having that in the uh, and understanding that in the initial certification is important. After the fact, uh, we, we now have to go back and try to determine what failures and what uh, hazards uh, were not covered. Uh, so it's important that we do it in the beginning. And, and again, for those who don't, who may not have this background, talk about what certification is. Certification is uh, part of a, uh, looking at, uh, there's different parts of certification, and it is making sure that the manufacturer meets the requirements uh, as part of the regulatory agency. Uh, so 
uh, through that process, I think you uh, you heard me talk about uh, 251309. Uh, that is part of uh, the certification process in terms of airworthiness. Uh, so it's it's very important in terms of certification. Uh, in terms of what certification is, is making sure that that airplane is airworthy, making sure that the systems um, have been uh, analyzed and reviewed for potential hazards, and then communicating those hazards in, in this type of assessment, and then making sure that the pilots uh, are aware of those types of situations as part of certification. Uh, so th that's there's several different parts of certification, but one part that's uh, it's also important is airworthiness uh, and meeting the requirements for airworthiness. Thank you. And the reason why I'm asking is because I imagine there's some questions about how could an airplane and its system be certified without considering also all possible failure conditions. How can this be missed by the certification agency? And so as part of uh, a safety engineer's job is using engineering judgment and assumptions, but they also have requirements. And safety engineers are considered experts. Uh, and they're considered experts because they understand the function of the system, including the failures. But there are times where there may be an assumption that was made, or there may have been a miss in terms of a particular failure mode. And when that, when that assessment is passed on to the regulatory agency for review, uh, that agency is taking that uh, assessment based off of what that safety engineer or engineers have put together uh, as, a, as their best understanding of the system. And uh, Member Graham had asked about SMS, and you had talked about um, why it was needed and how it would be beneficial. What some of the hit, can you talk a little bit because our, our draft report isn't out yet, and it does discuss this. Can you talk a little bit about the history on SMS for uh, manufacturers, designers? Uh, there's some history here with ICAO and IASA, and I know Saab was in the process of developing an SMS, but hadn't completed it. Can you just talk about where we are on that and uh, how we've gotten to some FAA action? Yes, in terms of FAA, uh, uh, there's about, uh, we, we were told there's about uh, 1,400 uh, uh, active manufacturers uh, that are part of the voluntary SMS for manufacturers, 13 of which um, are, are in the process um, uh, of, of that, of, of the voluntary SMS. There's another uh, four that have received approval um, in terms of uh, part five uh, for the intent uh, uh, of um, SMS, and uh, another nine, I believe, that are uh, in the process as well. Um, so from that, from the FAA side, the FAA has put the SMS uh, voluntary program together to help manufacturers understand not only the four components, but how to uh, um, assess uh, certain aspects of SMS. Um, and IASA uh, is, is also in that process of, of developing SMS uh, for manufacturers. Uh, we were told that Saab, in an email in, uh, this year, that around 2022, uh, they uh, hope to have their SMS uh, implemented as part, as, the, as part of the EASA regulation. Well, and uh, Congress recognized the importance of SMS for manufacturers in legislation last December, December 2020. Uh, and included a section focused on uh, aircraft certification, safety and accountability which required FAA to initiate a rulemaking on SMS for uh, manufacturers and for others. So uh, we look forward to that rulemaking. And uh, I do have one last question. I just wanted to revisit one issue with Dr. Silva. Um, could you just briefly uh, revisit the data regarding propeller separation? Um, are there cases we've investigated indicating where there's significant risk to passengers? 
No, the data does not in indicate significant risk. We've had two serious injuries in the past 30, uh, sorry, 38 years, I believe. Um, and that, to put in context, is over hundreds of millions of flights. So that'll put that in context. The data does not support a concern. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. Uh, just making sure, uh, again, uh, any member can come back at any time to ask questions in, the, um, in this safety area or any other safety area, and we'll have a, a, a final section of safety issues where if there are follow-ups, uh, feel free. But uh, for now, the board will discuss oversight uh, by the Federal Aviation Administration, and we're going to start with uh, questions uh, from Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, could we talk a little bit about the uh, kind of expand the discussion on the runway uh, safety uh, uh, area categories? Uh, it seems to me that this is really a critical part of all of this, and the fact that uh, both Pen Air and the FAA missed that when they started to put the uh, the Saab 2000 into service and the different categories, the B2 versus the C3. Could we talk a little more about that and maybe do it in, in some layman's terms so that uh, our folks in the audience can understand why this is important? Sure, I can address that, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. So each aircraft is essentially giving a, a letter and a number designation by the FAA based on the aircraft's approach speed and its size. And the larger and faster aircraft, generally the letters go from B to C to D, and the numbers get higher from two to three to four. Um, the Saab 340, which was the critical aircraft for this particular airport on design, was a category B2. And that equates to a 300-foot runway safety area off the end of each runway and 150-foot wide runway safety area. Moving up to a 121-knot uh, approach speed as the um, Saab 2000 had, you end up with a 1,000-foot safety area off the end of each runway and a 500-foot wide. So a considerable amount more real estate or the equivalent real estate is needed um, to protect against uh, overruns for those aircraft. So looking at the, uh, the map that we saw uh, of the runway and the space available, uh, that wouldn't have worked at Dutch Harbor. Is, is that correct? Yes, they're physically constrained by bodies of water on both sides of the runway. So in updating their master plan, they're looking at multiple solutions to that, including very expensive ones of filling um, the, the, the water to increase their land size. There's also technologies available, um, one in particular called EMAS, which is a crushable concrete, which can be installed at the end of the runway that helps to provide additional deceleration in, in, a, in a smaller footprint. So if, if Dutch Harbor had had EMAS there, uh, would that have been sufficient to uh, keep the aircraft uh, in the runway safety area, do you think? I'll let uh, uh, Dr. Renzi comment on the specifics on the numbers, but I do believe that even a sufficiently sized runway safety area uh, for this, the, the C3 Saab 2000 would have stopped it. So an, an equivalent level of EMAS probably should have um, done the same thing. Dr. Renzi. Thank you. Yes, when we talk about EMAS, generally there's a design aircraft, a target aircraft um, size and speed, and it's typical for the runway departure speed to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 to 70 knots in terms of the energy state that that, that crushable concrete structure is designed to uh, slow down and decelerate safely without damaging the aircraft or injuring people. Uh, so in this case, the the aircraft departed, I think, the end of the landing distance available at about 52 knots uh, and entered the runway safety area, the 300-foot runway safety area, at right in that sort of sweet spot of ranges between about 50 and 70 knots. So we would expect that you could install such a system to arrest the aircraft if an overrun would occur in that speed range. So is there a choice or does the uh, either the carrier or the FAA have to make a choice as to either the airline has to use 
a aircraft with a, a small, a slower approach speed, or uh, the FAA has to uh, say, well, you know, you can't operate here with the uh, aircraft that you're proposing. Uh, is is that how the system is supposed to work? And if so, why didn't it? I would note that in, in interviews, we determined that the FAA did not have awareness of this mismatch of the safety area that existed versus what an aircraft like the Saab would need, nor were they could they point to any guidance, and we could not find any guidance to their inspectors that that should have been a consideration when they authorized Pan Air to operate at Dutch Harbor. Uh, so, and, and the airport itself has no authority to prohibit operations. They, and uh, Mr. Fedak can, Fedak can uh, expound on this perhaps, but my understanding was that they have no authority to restrict airplanes. They simply publish what the information is regarding the runway safety areas and then operators then determine their use or non-use of that runway. Uh, Madam Chair, if I could ask your indulgence, I'd like to go just a little bit longer uh, on this. Um, so the airport doesn't have the ability to restrict operations, but the FAA most certainly does. And the runway safety area requirements are theirs, are they not? The, run, the runway safety area is probably not best described as a requirement, but as a, a design criteria, uh, because the requirement, there's no requirement that an operator fly to a particular runway with a particular safety area, and nor is the FAA, nor is there a regulation requiring that uh, the FAA um, consider that. So to say that a runway safety area is required is probably not quite correct usage. Okay. Any any other uh, thoughts on this? Because it would seem to me this is kind of an important area. It, it is. And what we found here was a concern in that the FAA, the principal operation inspector, did not even have it on their checklist to consider the size of the runway safety area when approving a scheduled air carrier to land at an airport. We would have thought that at least that would have been under consideration. Um, and it certainly was not. Um, runway safety areas are again designed for a critical aircraft going into a particular 139 airport, a, a certif certificated airport. You may have one-off uh, carriers that are not scheduled operators that operate in there, larger aircraft. So certainly you can have other operators, but we want to ensure that for the scheduled carriers that are flying the, the traveling public, that the runway safety area is a consideration before an aircraft is approved to fly into a certificated airport. I understand. Thank you, uh, and thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for your indulgence. Board Member Graham. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to want to change the subject just a bit and talk about FAA oversight of Pan Air. Um, we look back at the history preceding the accident at Pan Air. Uh, we know in August 2017, they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy and ended operations uh, from Denver and Portland. June 2018, Pan Air suspended operations from Boston, citing loss of mechanics and pilots who accepted positions with other carriers. Finally, Pan Air emerged out of bank from bankruptcy and was merged with Corbis Airlines, a Raven Air carrier group. So shortly after that acquisition and merger, the FAA certification management team transitioned a new frontline manager and POI how did the uh, previous POI describe the transition? The previous POI described the transition as uh, normal. He could he stated he did he had no specific safety concerns to pass on to the incoming POI. He did describe several lengthy conversations he had with him about the airline, but uh, was not uh, highlighting particular issues that the new POI needed to be aware of yeah and how did the new frontline manager manager characterize the operation as it related to the risk and in, risk indicators in the faa's assessment tool if i recall the frontline manager's interview he stated that i believe he stated that he felt that uh, all the risk indicators that they had uh, identified through the use of their tools 
were being handled sufficiently by the, the current surveillance plan. He did not identify or he was not aware of a need to increase or change the the FA surveillance plan for Pen Air. Yeah, exactly. And despite of what the POI and frontline manager indicated, Pen Air had experienced significant safety deficiencies. Uh, one of them being the example of the, the change of PIC airport qualifications procedure that you did highlight in this accident. Um, you know, I, I've been part of a, a manufacturer who acquired a, another large manufacturer and um, and merged. And it, it is a big deal because what people don't understand is you get two sets of policies, procedures, processes, um, two cultures, two different cultures and safety programs merging together. And it's it's difficult even in the best of circumstances. But then you add in financial distress and potential for cost cutting uh, initiatives and that just adds another additional layer of complexity to it so um, within all of that an operation must not compromise safety and in this case some additional FAA oversight uh, and another set of eyes on this operation would have been a good thing for Pan Air. Um, that's all the questions I have in this uh, safety segment uh, Madam Chair thank you. Thank you, Member Chapman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, want to pick up on uh, uh, Vice Chairman Landsberg's line of question. I, I have to confess I'm a little bit confused about how the process, uh, FAA's process for authorizing air carriers uh, functions. So during the process of authorizing an air carrier to operate its aircraft at specific airports, does FAA's current process require the consideration of runway safety area dimensions or runways of intended use? Is that a requirement? It is not. Okay, so um, in FAA's process, and I don't mean just with respect to runway safety areas, but the process for authorizing an air carrier to operate at a specific airport is that a process directed by regulation or is it a process that's established as a matter of agency policy? It's directed by regulation and, and guidance is given inspectors in the form of the inspector's handbook, a very large collection of materials that designed to give the inspector all the items he should look at for any particular thing he is inspecting. There is a section in that handbook about how to issue operations specifications that authorize carriers to operate at select airports or particular airports and nothing in that section had any mention of considering runway safety areas when that decision when that authorization is given okay so if if a more robust consideration of runway safety area dimensions were to be implemented would that be implemented through the development of op specs I believe it could be implemented just through a change of the, uh, the guidance that the FAA has to their inspectors about what items they should consider when they are approving airports for operation. Uh, that would be simply a revision of the FAA administrative procedures to put that on the list of things the inspector should look at. Okay, so this could be done, this more, ro more robust consideration of runway safety area dimensions, this could be done without regulatory changes. Uh, I, I see my counterpart, Mr. Fadak, not a yes, but I would say yes, that's the case. Okay, okay. Um, I, I'm unfamiliar with the current level of commercial air service at Dutch Harbor. Since the accident, has FAA taken steps to ensure that the airport is served only by carriers operating aircraft for which the existing runway safety areas are adequate? To my knowledge, they have not in that they have no requirement or, or authority to do that. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm hearing coming from this discussion is that's not something that FAA currently. I mean, I would argue that they have the authority to do that, but it doesn't sound like they currently have a process for doing that. And I'll just reiterate, that's the intent of the, our proposed recommendation is to really raise awareness and, and essentially provide them with the guidance um 
to specifically empower them um, to look at the runway safety areas uh, when considering approval of um, airport operation for carriers. And I just want to add uh, that it, it's what we're asking for is some consideration of this criteria as part of a larger process. We are not in any way saying that any aircraft should be prohibited uh, if it doesn't meet a certain uh, standard. Uh, there may be mitigations for air, you know the, the weights or the temperatures that they operate at that you could have an aircraft that is longer or faster in approach speed than than the the runway safety area supports, but there are operational mitigations that could be in place to prevent uh, an overrun situation like we had here. And again, that, that could be weight limitations or other sorts of operational limitations. And you would see that being implemented again through op, uh, operation specifications or op specs? Yes, that, I, I believe that could be done through the, the FAA's issuance process for the operation specifications. Mm -hmm. um, this is a interesting um, uh, twist on this. I, I have to confess, I didn't fully understand how all this fits together. This is useful. I thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Sure. Thanks, Member Chapman. And just a few questions, um, some which will reiterate some of the issues that you've already discussed. But on p page three of the draft report, we explained that the captain stated that the unfactored landing distance would be 3,058 feet, not, and not discussing the accuracy of that or not. What does unfactored landing distance mean? Unfactored landing distance is, is another term for actual landing distance that Saab provided uh, in, in the data they provided with the airplane, the actual distance that the runway, sh the airplane should take to stop under the particular conditions that that distance is provided for. But not if there are anomalies, like breaking anomalies or an anti-skid uh, system that's in, that's not in operation, correct? That's correct, correct. Right. So, um, the, and the Saab flight, the Saab 2000 flight manual and the Penn Air flight manuals both state that for anti-skid systems that are inoperative, the expected unfactored landing distance required will be increased, and, and I'm, I'm not looking to get into the numbers, will be increased by a factor of 2.2, which due to some math, maybe a little less than that. But Saab says, and this is, this is my point here, Saab says takeoff and landing with the anti-skid system inoperative will adversely affect the stop distance and landing distance. When considering landing performance, the landing distance required must be increased. So I, I'm not suggest this is on dispatch, and I'm not suggesting the pilot should have known this because he certainly would not have known this, that any of this would have occurred, that there was a brake system problem or an anti-skid uh, system that was inoperative. My point is that if Saab said this, somebody should have known and factored in to what a landing distance was needed at this airport or other safety measures put in place, as Mr. Fedak had mentioned, would be needed because, in fact, an anti-skid system could become inoperative. inoperative. We don't uh, uh, build systems for the best case scenario. We build them for the worst case scenario. Is that correct? I would, yes. Yes. You 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 do, you don't you don't implement something something based on what could potentially not be a, uh, an an accident. You take safety measures or implement safety measures based on the worst potential situation. Is that right, Dr. Silva? There there are design considerations for failures. That's right. And so here, if, if and I would add here, the FAA issued an advisory circular that we talk about in our draft report, which states that the operation of an aircraft that exceeds the design criteria of an, air, criteria of an airport may result in either an unsafe operation or a lesser safety margin, unless other measures are put in place. And we learned from the discussion that with that uh, the vice chairman had that the airport really didn't have 
really could not address this. The advisory circular in fact states what on um, for airports? Uh, I, it states aircraft operations cannot be prevented, regulated or controlled simply because the airport or runway does not meet the design standards for a particular aircraft type. So if you're the airport and people are wondering why the airport didn't take, act, take uh, more action, that is why. And so uh, I just was wondering if Dr. Silva, you could go through the numbers one more time of, uh, and I think if you pull up possibly slide eight, that might do it. If you, not, not uh, where touchdown was, but if you look at the runway, the runway length, what was needed in this case, uh, given uh, the safety issues at hand and uh, the brake anomaly and the anti-skid failure, what would have been needed? Right, right. Um, so I actually think we're gonna go to slide 10. Okay. And um, I'll let uh, Mr. Renzi follow up. Uh, this is the slide that, uh, we had some technical difficulties on, uh, but ultimately what you can see in the figure at the bottom uh, is in shaded in green is a visual depiction um, given various conditions of where you would have expected the airplane to stop if it had normal wheel braking, um, including the circumstances, uh, including the, the initial conditions essentially that the, that the crew had going in. Um, if there was a 50% loss in braking, which was something that was um, was considered from a design perspective, uh, then you would actually see the airplane capability um, of being able to stop either within the runway, within the runway surface, or uh, in the runway safety area as it exists today. Um, and per the calculations um, that were done in the performance study with the additional essentially 25% loss in braking that we saw with this specific cross wiring failure, um, the airplane would not have been able to stop. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Silva. Uh, are there other questions from my colleagues? In, the, in this area. Nope. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for all those excellent questions. But I now want to recognize my colleagues on the board for any other issues you'd like to discuss regarding this investigation, or if you want to circle back on issues we've already discussed in any of the areas to, for clarification. No questions? I'm going to ask one question, and it's going to be one I always ask uh, in board meetings, and we'll ask in every board meeting uh, of Ms. Hatchett. I, wa I would like, um, good afternoon, Ms. Hatchett. Good afternoon. Good to see you. I, uh, you are the director of our Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. And what I would like for people watching to understand is when we do board meetings, uh, this is, is the conclusion of our investigation, but it's not the end of our work for safety change. And I want you to talk about that so they know what happens now. Well, thank you for the question, uh, Chair Hamindy. Uh, I think this is a very important one. So after the board meeting, the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications partners with NTSB staff and members of the board to drive action toward implementing our recommendations in order to prevent future accidents, injuries, and fatalities from occurring. For example, we record and track the status of responses to all NTSB recommendations. We meet with the recipients of our recommendations to ensure they understand what actions we've asked them to take. We then evaluate those actions or inactions and engage with recipients explaining our evaluations and how to meet our recommendations if they haven't. We educate Congress, governors, and state legislatures about our recommendations and we monitor and encourage 
federal and state legislative efforts to improve safety. We engage with industry, government, and the public through media engagements, roundtable discussions, and external stakeholder collaborations to increase our safety recommendations and messages. And we execute advocacy campaigns, we conduct outreach, and we use a variety of communications tools to call attention to safety recommendations. This includes advocating for our actions on safety items featured on the NTSB's most wanted list. So you are correct. Once the board meeting is over, the agency work continues. Thank you so much for that. And I would point out that one of the issues on the most wanted li list is safety management systems, uh, one that I believe member Graham spearheads for us, uh, but a very critical issue and one that uh, we hope there's significant action uh, at FAA, both with respect to manufacturers and designers, but also with respect to operator operations. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we are going to take a 10 minute break. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to ask all participants to turn off their cameras and their microphones and we will reconvene at 315. Thank you so much. Okay, we're back in session. Do any of my colleagues have additional questions or comments on the presentations or the draft report before we move on to the findings? No? All right, Mr. Curtis, will you please read the proposed findings? Certainly, Chair. As a result of this investigation, staff proposes 17 findings. Number one, none of the following were factors in this accident. One, flight crew qualifications and airplane certification, which were in accordance with US regulations. Two, flight crew medical conditions. And three, the airworthiness of the airplane's structures and engines. Number two, the flight crew's decision to land on a runway with a reported tailwind that exceeded the airplane manufacturer's limit was intentional, inappropriate, and indicative of planned continuation bias. Number three, the captain demonstrated inadequate aeronautical decision-making skills regarding which runway to use for landing and a lack of flight deck leadership by continuing the landing to a runway with a significant tailwind. Number four, the evacuation delay for the crew members and some passengers was reasonable given the need to provide medical, medical emergency medical attention to the critically injured passenger and the emergency response was timely and effective. Number five, the incorrect routing of the wheel speed transducer wire harnesses most likely occurred during the landing gear manufacturer's overhaul of the left main landing gear and was undetected by Pen Air because such incorrect routing cannot be discovered unless a significant unrelieved skid event happens. Number six, as a result of the cross wiring of the left main landing gear, MLG, wheel speed transducers, the anti-skid system responded to the left outboard tire skid by completely releasing the brake pressure to the left and right MLG inboard wheels. Number seven, because the anti-skid system could not alleviate the left main landing gear, MLG, outboard tire skid, the tire subsequently burst and resulted in an, in, in an additional loss of MLG wheel braking. Number eight, the Saab 2000 could tolerate all the conditions at the time of the accident, except for a loss of main landing gear, MLG, wheel braking in excess of 50%. Thus, the combined loss of left and right inboard and left outboard MLG wheel braking prevented the flight crew from stopping the airplane on the runway. Number nine, a more robust design for the Saab 2000 wheel speed transducer wire harnesses that protects against human error could mitigate the potential for the incorrect installation of the harnesses. Number 10, 
the potential for cross wiring of wheel speed transducer harnesses during installation or maintenance exists for other airplane types. Number 11, safety management systems for aircraft designers, manufacturers, and repair stations would help identify and manage safety risks that current safety processes might not effectively mitigate. Number 12, Penair's decision to allow the captain to operate at Unalaska Airport as a pilot in command, PIC, without meeting the PIC airport qualification criteria was inconsistent with company policy to ensure the necessary skill and experience level to operate at the airport. Number 13, the captain might not have fully understood the challenges associated with landing the Saab 2000 at Unalaska Airport because he had not achieved the experience that the company designated pilot in command airport qualification policy intended. Number 14, deficiencies associated with Penair's safety management system decreased its effectiveness and resulted in reduced pilot feedback to management about safety concerns. Number 15, the Federal Aviation Administration's oversight of Pen Air during the two years before the accident was insufficient to identify safety risks resulting from the company's bankruptcy, reduced route structure, loss of experienced pilots, acquisition, and merger. Number 16, the accident airplane would have been able to stop within a runway safety area that was suitable for the approach speed and size of the Saab 2000. And number 17, during the process of authorizing an air carrier to operate its aircraft at specific airports, the consideration of runway safety area dimensions for runways of intended use could help increase the aircraft's margin of safety if a runway excursion were to occur. Madam Chair. Thank this time, we'll do a roll call to make sure that all board members are ready to deliberate. Vice Chairman Landsberg. I'm ready to deliberate, ma'am. Member Graham. Ready to deliberate, uh, Member Ho or, uh, Chairman Hamidi. Member Chapman. Ready to go, Chair. Okay, are there any questions on or amendments to the proposed findings? No? Okay, do we have a motion to adopt the findings as presented? So moved. Second. Second. Moved by motion to adopt the findings as presented, moved by Vice Chairman Landsberg, seconded by Member Graham. Uh, do, does any member have any additional issues on the propose, proposed findings for discussion? Okay, so the motion has been seconded again by Member Graham. We'll now conduct a roll call vote. Those in favor say aye. All, anybody who is opposed say nay. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Chapman. Aye. The chair votes aye, so the motion is approved unanimously and the findings are adopted as presented. Uh, Mr. Curtis, would you like to uh, read the proposed probable cause? Staff proposes the following probable cause. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of this accident was the landing gear manufacturer's incorrect wiring of the wheel speed transducer harnesses on the left main landing gear during overhaul. The incorrect wiring caused the anti-skid system not to function as intended, resulting in the failure of the left outboard tire and a significant loss of the airplane's braking ability, which led to the runway overrun. Contributing to the accident were one, Saab's design of the wheel speed transducer wire harnesses which did not consider and protect against human error during maintenance. And two, the Federal Aviation Administration's lack of consideration of the runway safety area dimensions at Unalaska Airport during the authorization process that allowed the Saab 2000 to operate at the airport. The safety margin was further reduced during landing because of one, the flight crew member's inappropriate decision due to their planned continuation bias 
to land on a runway with a reported tailwind that exceeded the airplane manufacturer's limit, and two, Penair's failure to correctly apply its company-designated pilot-in-command airport qualification policy, which allowed the accident captain to operate at one of the most challenging airports in Penair's route system with limited experience at the airport and in the Saab 2000 airplane. Chair? Thank you so much, Mr. Curtis. Are there any amendments to the probable cause as proposed? I do have an amendment, Chair. Member Chapman, you're recognized. My proposed amendment was circulated uh, last night. I believe you all have the language. Uh, shall I read my amendment? Yes, please. Thank you so much. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the accident was the landing gear manufacturer's incorrect wiring of the wheel speed transducer harnesses on the left main landing gear during overhaul. The incorrect wiring caused the anti-skid system not to function as intended, resulting in the failure of the left outboard tire and the significant loss of the airplane's braking ability, which led to the runway overrun. Contributing to the accident were, one, Saab's design of the wheel speed transducer higher, uh, wire harnesses, which did not consider and protect against human error during maintenance, strike, and two, the Federal Aviation's lack of consideration of the runway safety area dimensions at Unalaska Airport during the authorization process that allowed the Saab 2000 to operate at the airport, insert, comma, and three, strike, the safety margin was further reduced during landing because of one, and continuing on, the flight crew members' inappropriate decision due to their planned continuation bias to land on a runway with a reported tailwind that exceeded the airplane manufacturer's limit. Insert, the safety margin was further reduced because of strike and strike two. Continuing on, Pen Air's failure to correctly apply its company designated pilot in command airport qualification policy, which allowed the accident captain to operate at one of the most challenging airports in Pen Air's route system with limited experience at the airport and in the Saab 2000 airplane. I know that's relatively complex. I'll be happy to explain it or to read it as amended. Great, thank you very much. Um, and for those watching, there's a probable cause, a section on contributing to the accident uh, and a section on reduction of safety margin. And your amendment is just moving the uh, flight crew members inappropriate decision making up into contributing to the accident, which I'm sure you'll discuss. I just thought I would summarize. Uh, so is there a second? Second. Second. Seconded by member Graham. Uh, discussion on the amendment, starting with member Chapman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my proposed amendment, as you indicated, would elevate the significance of the flight crew's inappropriate decision making citing it as a factor directly contributing to the accident and assigning the same level of significance as Saab's design of the wire harnesses and the FAA's lack of consideration of the runway safety area dimensions. As presented to us, the draft probable cause names the landing gear manufacturer's incorrect wiring of the wheel speed transdu transducer harnesses as the cause of the accident and the draft also identifies two categories of factors which impacted the accident, those which direct, directly contributed to the cause and those which resulted in a reduced margin of safety. While I endorse this basic structure, I believe the current draft mischaracterizes the crew's inappropriate decision-making as a factor which merely reduced the margin of safety. In good conscience, I believe we must place greater emphasis on the role of the crew in this accident. My amendment would make that change. The crew's inappropriate decision-making was far more impactful than merely reducing the margin of safety. Certainly, it was at least as significant 
as FAA's lack of, of consideration of the inadequate runway safety area. And with that, I thank my colleagues for their consideration. Thank you, Member Chapman. Are there other members who would like to be recognized for discussion on the amendment? Member Graham. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm supportive of this amendment, uh, as, especially as being a former or uh, being a pilot, but uh, I think our findings number two and three uh, state this very clearly, and it I think it would be appropriate to add uh, this to the uh, contributing factor, so I'm supportive of it. Thank you very much. Any other uh, statements on the amendment? I too uh, felt that the the findings, especially three, the uh, captain demonstrated inadequate aeronautical decision making skills regarding which runway to use for landing and a lack of flight deck leadership by continuing the landing to a runway with a significant tailwind. We did see an aborted landing and lots of discussion about the wind, and we did have discussion with the staff earlier about the decision making for one way three one instead of one three and would that have prevented this accident if the decision which should have been runway three one was made uh with a headwind in that landing uh and it was stated that in in what it would have been able to land uh safely so uh, with that, I would like to ask, does staff has, have a position on the proposed amendment? Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, the, the staff uh, disagrees with the proposed amendment. And uh, although the decision to land uh, was inappropriate based on the uh, conditions that were last reported to, to the crew uh, on approach, um, the aircraft study, our aircraft uh, performance study uh, at time of touchdown indicated that uh, given the actual conditions, the uh, state of the aircraft configuration and energy state of the aircraft, environmental conditions and, and uh, runway surface conditions that the aircraft could have in fact stopped on the runway um, if not for the uh, loss of more than 50 percent of braking. So we, uh, we, yeah, we welcome uh, any further questions if you want to clarify our, our position at all, uh, but uh, we do disagree with, with that amendment. Thank you, Mr. Helson. Member Chapman, Member Graham, do others have questions or want to continue on in that discussion? Just a brief comment, uh, Chair Hamandy. Uh, I certainly respect the, the, our team's position on this. I do disagree. Uh, the crew's decision-making was inappropriate regardless of the actual tailwind at the point of touchdown with reports of a 24 knot tailwind very near in time to the point of touchdown the decision was made to land in spite of the tailwind the actual tailwind at touchdown was not known to the crew and nor realistically could it have been so again i urge support for the amendment yeah, Member Chapman, thank you for that. And I think that was an excellent line of questioning earlier because what the what the flight crew knew was was significantly higher tailwind that exceeded, well exceeded the operational limitations of its aircraft, which were 15 knots. But I understand our aircraft performance study found that on touchdown it was 15 knots, but the crew wouldn't have known that. They knew 24 knots going in, and it actually exceeded at some point up to 30 knots of wind gusts throughout uh, the discussion um, uh, uh, in the cockpit. Um, other other uh, comments by anyone? All right. Uh, I do thank um, uh, Mr. Helson for uh, his um, uh, uh, analysis of the proposed uh, amendment and for for the staff comments. We do value those, so appreciate that. Uh, so a motion to amend the uh, um, probable cause has uh, been offered by Member Chapman and seconded by Member Graham. Hearing no further discussion, 
Uh, we will have a roll call vote. So, Vice Chairman Lansford. I vote aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Chapman. Aye. The chair votes aye, so uh, the vote is unanimous in favor of amending the probable cause uh, as offered in the motion by Member Chapman. Are there other amendments to the probable cause? No other amendments, and I know we've done this two different ways in the past, but council has recommended, even though we've amended uh, the probable cause to now have a vote on the actual amended probable cause. So uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, do that. Is there a motion to adopt the probable cause as amended? So moved. That was a tie. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Vice Chairman Landsberg. And uh, is there a second? Second. Moved uh, uh, by Ch Vice Chairman Landsberg, seconded by Member Chapman. Thank you very much. And we'll go to a roll call on uh, adopting the probable cause as amended. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Chapman. Aye. Chair votes aye. The vote is unanimous in favor of adopting the probable cause as amended. Thanks very much. And Mr. Curtis, will you please read the proposed recommendations? Certainly, Chair. As a result of this investigation, staff proposes the following 10 new safety recommendations. Six to the Federal Aviation Administration. Number one, identify all currently certificated transport category airplanes for which safety system safety assessments for landing gear systems did not consider human error that could lead to cross wiring of anti-skid brake system components, including the wheel speed transducers and require manufacturers of transport category airplanes without such assessments to perform the assessments and then implement mitigations to, to prevent cross wiring of anti-skid brake system components. Number two, require the submission and consideration of system safety assessments addressing the landing gear anti-skid system for the certification of future transport category airplane designs. The certification should ensure that the system safety assessments are consistent with the intent of, of Advisory Circular 25.1309 System Design and Analysis, and that the assessments evaluate and mitigate the potential for human error that can lead to a cross-wiring error. Number three, require organizations that design, manufacture, and maintain aircraft to establish a safety management system. Number four, notify principal operations inspectors and frontline managers about the circumstances of this accident and emphasize the importance of existing Federal Aviation Administration guidance for detecting and mitigating the safety risks that can result when certificate holders experience significant organizational change, such as high personnel turnover, a reduction to route structures or flight schedules, bankruptcy, acquisition, and merger. Number five, revise order 8900.1, Flight Standards Information Management System, to include a formalized transition procedure to be used during a changeover of certificate management team personnel responsible for overseeing a certificate holder that is undergoing significant organizational change, parent for a reason described in volume six, chapter two, section 18 of the order, close parent, to ensure that the incoming personnel are fully aware of potential safety risks. Number six, include the runway design code for runways of intended use among the criteria assessed when authorizing a scheduled air carrier to operate its airplanes on a regular basis at an airport certificated under Title 14, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 139. Three recommendations to the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. Number seven, identify all currently certificated transport category airplanes for which system safety assessments for landing gear systems did not consider human error that could lead to cross wiring of anti skid brake system components, including the wheel speed transducers, 
and require manufacturers of transport category airplanes without such assessments to perform the assessments and then implement mitigations to prevent cross wiring of anti skid brake system components. Number eight, require the submission and consideration of system safety assessments addressing the landing gear anti skid system for the certification of future transport category airplane designs. The certification should ensure that the safety system safety assessments are consistent with the intent of acceptable means of compliance 25.1309 systems design and analysis and that the assessments evaluate and mitigate the potential for human error that can lead to a cross wiring error. Number nine, require organizations that design, manufacture, and maintain aircraft to establish a safety management system. And one safety recommendation to Saab. Number 10, redesign the wheel speed transducer wire harnesses for the Saab 2000 airplane to prevent the harnesses from being installed incorrectly during maintenance and overhaul. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Curtis. Are there any questions on or amendments to the recommendations as proposed? No amendments. Okay, do we have a motion to adopt the recommendations as proposed? So moved. Is there a second? Second. A motion to adopt the recommendations as pr proposed was offered by Member Graham, seconded by, by Vice Chairman uh, Landsberg. Uh, do any, does any member have any additional issues on the proposed recommendations for discussion? Hearing none, okay, the motion has been seconded, so we'll have a roll call vote. Vote, Vice Chairman Landsberg. Aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Chapman. Aye. The chair votes aye, and so the vote is unanimous in favor of adopting the recommendations as presented. Uh, does any member have any additional issues for discussion until we move forward with the adoption of the report? No. Is there a motion to adopt the report as, as revised? So moved. Second. Moved by Member Chapman, seconded by Vice Chairman Landsberg. Uh, the motion to adopt the report as, as revised has been seconded. So, Vice Chairman Landsberg. I vote aye. Member Graham. Aye. Member Chapman. Aye. The chair votes aye, so the vo vote is unanimous in favor of adopting the report as revised. Does any member have any additional issues for discussion? Oh. Okay, so with that, uh, are, does anyone, uh, any member wish to reserve the right to file a concurring or dissenting statement? All right, no, hearing no further discussion, I'd like to invite uh, the uh, Vice Chairman and uh, Member Graham and Member Chapman to go ahead and keep your cameras on. As our deliberations have now come to an end, I want to thank uh, my colleagues on the board for your pre preparation going into the board meeting and for the discussion today. I thought the discussion was excellent. And on behalf of the board, I want to thank our colleagues in the Office of Aviation Safety and the Office of Research and Engineering for their work over the course of this investigation and the development of an excellent report. I also want to thank our colleagues in the NTSB's Transportation Disaster Assistance Division, who coordinate resources and information for survivors, families, and friends of those involved in the accidents we investigate. And I want to thank our colleagues in safety recommendations and communications who work hard daily to ensure our recommendations are implemented. The recommendations we've issued today, when acted upon, will improve aviation safety and save lives. We look forward to working with our partners in safety as they implement those recommendations. And finally, We'd like to offer a sincere thank you to everyone who helped bring this board meeting together and to the working group that has been looking at ways to ensure our board meetings are engaging and informative. Let us know 
what you thought or think about the new board meeting format. We're still trying it out and you can email us with your thoughts at boardmeeting at ntsb.gov. Again, that's boardmeeting at ntsb.gov. And we stand adjourned. <laughs>